Hi, and good afternoon, and welcome to the Hartford Medical Society's Lunchtime Learning. We're glad you can join us today. Today, we feature Medical Curiosities Revealed, the Bordeloo edition. If you don't know what a Bordeloo is, you will very, very soon. It is my honor today to introduce to you the president of the Hartford Medical Society, Dr. Bernard Costo. Dr. Costo, take it away. Good day. My name is Bernard Costo. After I was discharged from the Navy during the Vietnam War, I began the solo practice of urology in Hartford in 1970. For many years, in addition to doctoring, I have been a collector. As a medical student with an unusual blood factor, I would sell my blood and use the proceeds to buy antique medical books and artifacts. Now, my collection of urologic artifacts resides in the Didish Museum of Urology outside of Baltimore, and my books have a home in the Cushing Whitney Library at Yale. However, I haven't given up the collecting bug. Once a collector, always a collector. Some 20 years ago, I was sent a photo of a strange object by Elizabeth Benyon, the author of the seminal book on medical antiques. She thought, as a urologist, I might be interested in it. Indeed, I had never seen anything similar. It was a bordeloup, which is defined in the French dictionary as a vase de nuit, une sorte de petite urine noire placative, et de forme oblongue dont se servant les femmes, a small, portable, oblong urinal for female use. These were employed by women from the 18th through the 19th century. The Bordeloup looks like a gravy boat or saucier. It differs in several ways. The gravy boat has a footed rim or pedestal, whereas the Bordeloup sits flat. The gravy boat has a spout for pouring, but the Bordeloup does not. The Bordeloup has a single handle and its sides are lower in the middle than at either end. Some Bordeloups have sides which dip inward toward the middle. My talk today includes elements of history, social mores, commerce, decorative arts, and ceramic chemistry. Question number one, how are Bordeloups used? We are familiar with how women use today's bathroom, but the process was different 200 years ago. These photos illustrate women's outer clothing in the aristocratic class. We, next, we go next to the history of women's underwear. Indeed, there is significant writing on the subject, which probably has never been addressed by the Wadsworth Museum Costume and Textile Society. I quote from one text. When you are wearing a chemise, a corset, a bodice, stockings, multiple petticoats, and a dress, your choices were stripping naked or not stripping at all. Before the 1800s, polite women would go commando. If you look up the etymology of that phrase in the Oxford English Dictionary, it is attributed to commandos not wearing underwear. This 17th century engraving of a peasant woman is by none, on our, none other than Rembrandt von Rhein. Now, prostitutes were the only ones who bothered with underpants. Pants were a symbol of men's authority. Later on came pantalettes, two pant legs tied together with a string. As the crinoline came into vogue, split drawers or crotchless underwear became more popular. Here are four contemporary illustrations of women using bordeloups. The first is an 18th century pastel of a young woman reaching across her bed for her bordeloup. Regrettably, I flooded the chance to acquire that portrait from a Belgian dealer. So much for not taking advantage when things when they are offered. The next photo is an illustration from an 18th century etui 
which is a small ceramic decorative container for personal articles. This etui had illustrations on each side of everyday life, one of which is a woman using a bordeloo. It is in the Louvre. I remember well my trip through the long corridor of offices to visit the museum curator that day, very French. The next photo is that of a painting by an unknown artist that was in a private collection in Munich. In a few minutes, I will tell you about that collection and the museum and its owner. The next photo is a famous photo by the French court artist Francois, Francois Boucher. It is in entitled La Toilette Intime. It was painted about 1760 and it is in a museum in Paris. Although urination or more clinically micturition is a normal human function, the collection of urine in a receptacle did not occur until relatively late in the history of mankind. Right up until the 19th century, it was customary to urinate outdoors somewhere. This was true of Western civilization as well as primitive people. Urination into a receptacle was restricted to the aristocracy or used for medical purposes such as in uroscopy. A friend and I took a trip to the Chateau country in the Loire Valley long ago, the chateau where once Joan of Arc stayed and where our wives suddenly found the urge to relieve themselves. In one of the castle turrets, there was an opening in the wall over the moat with an opening in the bottom where the castle inhabitants relieved themselves. We stood guard outside the room for our wives. Now, male urinals did exist in ancient times and they can be traced back to the Greeks. They were essential during meals and drinking sessions where according to Aristophanes, guests relieved themselves with the assistance of slaves. Athenus, a third century Greek author wrote a work, Dionysophist, about people skilled in dining. Quote, they, the horsemen of the Sybarites, were also the first to invent chamber pots, which they carried to their drinking parties. Heliogbalus, the emperor, excelled all others in his prodigious luxury. His excrements were discharged into golden vessels, and he urinated into vessels of onyx. Now, with that story in mind, here is an illustration of a bordeloo of precious stone, agate, which was made in 19th century Tsarist Russia. And let us not be outdone. At the Guggenheim Museum, there was a recent installation of a 14 karat gold toilet for the visitor's actual use. I didn't pass up the opportunity to use it. In fact, it turns out that that gold toilet was later stolen. Now, our discussion today, however, is about women. So what, if anything, did wealthy women do in ancient times? I have correspondence with the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Corning Glass Museum about a group of Roman glass models of boats, of which six are known. The Latin word scaphium derives from the Greek scaphion or boat, but on some occasions, it does mean a chamber pot of boat shape. It is interesting that two examples were found buried in women's homes in Pompeii, one in a woman's grave and a smaller one in a female child's funerary urn. So it is conceivable that these were bordeloos or oval-shaped female urinals that antedated what I collect by nearly two millennia. While the Romans were skilled at glassware, half a world away at the same time, the Chinese were perfecting pottery from clay to glazed earthenware to what would eventually become the porcelain we know today. Ceramics are the first entirely man-made objects. They were used for food storage, cooking, and transporting water. 
Pottery was made with coils of clay squashed together and smoothed out so that the seams did not leak. During the Shang Dynasty between 1600 and 1028 BC, borrowing from the technology of the Bronze Age, there were the first construction of kilns suitable for firing ceramics at high temperature. Porous earthenware could be made impervious to fluid by applying a glaze to the surface during the firing process. By the Zhu Dynasty, 1027 to 771 BC, kilns were fired to 1200 degrees centigrade or 2192 degrees Fahrenheit. The sand and clay together were semi-fluxed or vitrified to form a more adherent and compact pottery and porcelain. By the early Tang Dynasty in 618 to 906 AD, porcelain was being produced on a vast scale. At the National Museum of Singapore, there is an exhibit of a ship that sank 1,200 years ago. It was found to contain 60,000 pieces of ceramic. It would take, however, until the 17th century before Europeans were able to duplicate Chinese porcelain. Although there was trade between the East and West during the Byzantine Empire and into the Middle Ages, and some knowledge was known in Europe through the writings of Marco Polo, it was Vasco da Gama who sailed around the Cape of Good Hope in 1497 and opened trading routes to India and the Far East. By the 1520s, the Portuguese had visited China, and by the mid-1500s, trading posts were established. North of the port city of Canton, where the Europeans were allowed to have trading stations, was the village of Zhengqin, where an imperial ceramic factory had been established. Nearby the village was a supply of kaolin, a clay material with silicates and feldspar, a mica-rich powdered granite. Neither of these two contained iron. When the feldspar and the kaolin were mixed together in appropriate amounts and now fired in kilns that reached 1400 degrees or 2550 degrees Fahrenheit, a beautiful, gleaming white porcelain was produced. It was this Zhengchen porcelain which was highly prized among the nobility in Europe. It was correspondingly extremely expensive. The VOC, or Dutch East India Company, succeeded the Portuguese and became the major commercial conduit between China and their European customers. Pottery was made to European specifications and was used as ballast in the trading vessels. Porcelain, unlike grain or silk, would not be harmed by water in the bottom of a ship's hold. The only recently found cargo ship, Texing, sang, uh, sank on its way to Batavia, modern day Jakarta, in 1822 with 350,000 pieces of porcelain in its hold. Listed in its cargo manifest were oval urinals. Europeans in the Middle Ages and beyond did have glazed earthenware, which was clay fired at lower temperatures and coated with a tin-based glaze. The Italian city of Faenza produced pottery, which we call faience. Similar production in Spain and other parts of Italy often colorfully, colorfully decorated with metal oxide enamel is known as majolica. It would be a couple of hundred years before the Europeans could find similar ingredient, ingredients as used by the Chinese and learn to build high temperature kilns. In the 16th century, the Netherlands was ruled by Catholic Spain. Potters from Spain migrated north and established themselves in the city of Delft. 
the city is synonymous with ceramics, but why Delft? Commercial economics, commercial economics. Originally, Delft was known for its beer, but with the pollution of the local water supply, the breweries closed and the potters found ample factory space in the old buildings. You may be asking, where am I going with this brief history of earthenware and porcelain? Let me try to tie this together. In the late 17th century, chamber pots were big, heavy, and round. They were hard to use. Gradually, they became smaller and of a more female-oriented anatomical space. Slide. This is a small, round Delft pot, which because of its size is deemed a bordeloo. The next slide shows a faience bordeloo, which now has the beginnings of an elliptical or oval shape. And finally, the next slide illustrates a Delft bordeloo from the beginning of the 1700s when bordeloos first appear, first appeared. Notice that it is decorated in a Chinese motif. Let me pause here for a little more etymology. The common name for these oval female urinals of Vaz de Nui is Bordeloo. Where did that name originate? The name first appeared in French dictionaries in 1745. But according to tradition, the name relates to Louis Bordeloo who was a Jesuit in the service of the Sun King, Louis XIV. He was especially famous among the aristocratic women of Versailles for his enthralling sermons. They would flock to church early to procure a seat, which they would be loath to give up for fear of losing their place. What to do when nature called? Yes, servants would furnish oval-shaped urinals from their muffs and their mistresses would quietly slip them up between their legs for relief. This wonderful story has endured through the centuries, but at last, but alas, it is surely apocryphal. Louis Bordeloo died in 1704. The first Bordeloos appeared in 1710. Now other name possibilities include Bord a low, the high water mark from flooding on Parisian houses, and bordelo, a French word in the French Provençal dialect meaning refuse. Now, let me turn my attention to the beginning of high quality porcelain in Europe. In the early 1700s, Augustus the Strong, Elector of Saxony, hired an alchemist named Johann Friedrich Botger who lived from 1682 to 1790. He hired him to make gold. Botker, under pressure, never succeeded in making gold, but he did invent hard paste porcelain in 1708 by combining several parts of kaolin to one part of alabaster. Later, he substituted feldspar for the alabaster. He had succeeded in duplicating Chinese quality porcelain with local materials where everyone else had failed. Notice that Botker died at age 37. The Meissen Porcelain Factory was founded by Augustus in 1710. Up until Botker, Europeans tried to figure out how to make porcelain through spying and poaching of talent. The French had been making soft paste porcelain, which is fired at a temperature 200 degrees lower than hard paste, for a number of years. Soft paste looks, feels, and sounds different when pinged. There were factories at Sèvres, Vincennes, Chantilly, and Saint Cloud. They were producing soft paste porcelain in the late 1700s. For those of you visiting Paris, and that may happen one day again, the National Museum of Ceramics at Seb is a metro ride away over the Seine. It is wonderful exhibits of both antique and modern ceramics. It is highly worth the trip. All of this frantic porcelain activity throughout Europe included some fascinating skullduggery. Remember, lots of money was involved. 
In 1730, Count Heinrich von Hoym set a standard for underhanded dealing. After his appointment as a director of the Meissen factory, he conspired with a Parisian dealer, Rudolf Lemaire, to steal thousands of pieces of Meissen and to sell them to the unsuspecting French as the very expensive Jingshan Chinese porcelain. Now, the Chinese porcelain did not have a mark on its base. Von Hoym sold the French Le Maire Meissen porcelain without the blue cross sword marks on the base of the porcelain. Or he arranged that the mark on top of the last glo glazing coat could be sanded off. These guys were later apprehended and sent to jail. Photo 19 is a Meissen board loop in the Kekamon design sold by Le Maire. This is in my collection, but does have the Meissen mark, so it was not one of the ones sold by Le Maire. Interestingly, forgeries command a much higher price than the original. Another Meissen in my collection comes with its original carrying case. It was brought by a family who immigrated from Europe. The insect design is 18th century. The handle was broken long ago and was replaced by a contemporary bronze. Next is a Meissen Borlu with a Commedia dell'arte scene. It is not in my collection. It was sold at auction a number of years ago for nearly $100,000 US. Now this illustrates one problem with collecting. I collect because of the form. After all, I'm a urologist, but I run into competition from people whose interest is the porcelain. For instance, this past December of 2020, Bonhams, the auction house in London, auctioned a Dupacier Bordeloup, which was made in 18th century Vienna. It was part of a collection stolen during the Holocaust. This Bordeloup brought over $140,000 US. The next Bordeloup is Meissen, and it dates from 1745. It is called Schneeballen, or Snowballs. This gorgeous pot is the star of my collection. One has to wonder how, with all of the sharp flower petals, it be, could be used comfortably. A number of years ago, I flew to Munich to visit ZAM slide, the Center for Unusual Museums. It was founded by a personal injury lawyer named Manfred Klauda and funded privately by him to house his vast collection of toy pedal cars, Easter bunnies, padlocks, perfume bottles, artifacts belonging to the last Queen of Austria, and chamber pots. The latter included 300 Bordeloups. I had a very nice vegetarian lunch in sausage famous Munich with Manfred, and then visited his uh, collection. Unfortunately, Manfred died in an auto accident, and his daughter, Yuda inherited his collection. More than 10 years ago, I returned to Germany, this time to Kreuz, which is below Munich in Bavaria where Jutta lived. Kreuz is a fairy tale town in an hour south of Munich in the Lake District. It was not destroyed in the war because the German commandant display, dis disobeyed orders and surrendered to the Americans sort of reminds you what happened in Paris at the end of the war. While in Kreuz, I cataloged and photographed the Clouda collection. It was later sold and donated to museum. Now, the formal presentation is now concluded, but I will be happy to answer any questions, and then I will scroll through my collection and comment upon some of what I think are interesting items. Thank you, Dr. Costo. What we are going to do now is 
If you have any questions at this point, feel free to type them into chat. You may raise your hand. I do have one question for you. Okay. And it's from Jay Smith. Who produced these products, um, i.e. Limoges, et cetera? I think you kind of covered that, but if you well, want to address that. There were a variety. Limoges was one of the factories that made porcelain. Uh, Bordeaux and uh, they were, Limoges is still in business, uh, but Bordeaux were, uh, the, the production of Bordeaux stopped uh, when indoor toilets became available at the end of the 19th century. Okay. Well, let me, let me at this point uh, 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 point out an article that appeared in today's Hartford Current in the Connecticut Connecticut section. Uh, a little earlier, I discussed the uh, porcelain from Zhengchen in China and how expensive it was for Europeans. Today's article in the Hartford Current talks about a bowl that was purchased at a yard sale in Connecticut. Turns out to be Zhengchen porcelain, and it's up for auction at Sotheby's for between three hundred and $500,000. Interesting. Oh, my. So this is timely that we're, yep. we're doing this. Well, it is. Um, I think if there are no further questions, let's uh, go through a few of the uh, Bordelous in, in my collection. Uh, we'll start out first with... Uh, Dr. Costo, I do have one more question. Okay. Sure. Uh, were there carriage Bordelous? They, they, there were no carriage Bordelous, but in England, Bordelous are called coach pots. So I assumed uh, the reason they're coach pots is because people took them along uh, when they were in coaches. And one comment is that only you could make urine so breathtakingly interesting. <laughs> or at least the containers. <laughs> these, these, okay. these pretty containers are all French, uh, late uh, 1700s, early 1800s, nicely decorated with uh, gold and uh, were produced by one of them. I think a couple of the ones above are by the factory at Sev. And the next slide um, is again, French porcelain, beautifully decorated with uh, floral uh, examples. Uh, if we go on to another slide, uh, these are early Chinese Bordelous. Uh, they date from the early 1700s. They were made for European export. Uh, I call attention to the one in the upper right-hand corner. You notice that the red in the peony is sort of faded. And the reason for that is that the uh, red, which comes from iron, oxidized. And the reason it oxidized is because this Bordeaux was rescued from a shipwreck. It had been underwater for probably hundreds of years before somebody managed to salvage it. The one on the bottom is uh, a pretty decorated uh, uh, Chinese uh, with a crab up in the upper, upper border. Uh, they're all very pretty. Next uh, slide. Now, this is an interesting uh, series of Bordelous. It's called Chinese Armorial Porcelain. Uh, Europeans would uh, purchase sets of porcelain from China and they would have their own coats of arms uh, applied. In the lower right hand corner, there's an interesting story. This is a uh, set of uh, Bordelous from the Pinnock family. Pinnock was an English planter in Jamaica. His first wife died. The second wife, uh, he, he married again. Now, uh, it's not because the second wife didn't want to use the first wife's porcelain. The story is that the second wife was the only daughter in a family that had its own coat of arms. Usually, uh, coats of arms descended through male uh, progeny. Here, there was a female. So when she married into the Pinnock family, they put both coats of arms into this set of uh, Bordelous. You'll also notice that the Chinese and not the Europeans used covers. Uh, I don't know why that occurred, but uh, that's uh, certainly uh, you know obvious from the pictures you see here. 
Let's go on to the next slide. This is a very pretty Qinlung Dynasty uh, Bordelou from the 1700s. Uh, beautiful white, gleaming white, and uh, nice uh, decoration of uh, mountains and lakes and trees. Again, next slide. Now, let's go back to Europe. Uh, the one on the left is from uh, Strasbourg, dates from uh, 1700s, and the uh, porcelain Bordeaux has a figural face on the front of it. The one in the upper right-hand corner is in the shape of a seashell, it's called cochlear. And you'll also notice that the handle is in the form of a tree branch. This was uh, a European uh, decorative scheme. Let's go on here. Here are a couple of very pretty Bordelous that come from Vienna. These are Austrian. Uh, they have these very pretty little birds sitting on, on the top. Uh, it's amazing that they've stayed in one piece after all these years. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, Viennese and you notice the one above has a pattern in the uh, porcelain that makes it look as though it's woven and floral decoration, which was quite, quite common in the 1700s. Let's go on to the next one. This is a group of English uh, Bordelous, highly decorated, plaid, gold, a uh, number of factories in England uh, produce them and uh, they're quite uh, lovely uh, to look at. And uh, they uh, are, uh, uh, date, they date probably from the early to the mid, uh, late, uh, mid, early to mid uh, 1800s. Next slide. Now, Bordelous were not only made of porcelain, they were also made of metal. The one in the upper left-hand corner is sterling silver, obviously needs a little polishing. Uh, this is uh, German and it dates from the mid 1800s. The one on the lower left is pewter. This is French pewter, dates from the late 1700s. The one on the upper right is by the French firm Christophe, which is still in business. It's silver plate. One side has a monogram of the owner and the other side has a kitty cat. <laughs> finally, the uh, one in the lower right-hand corner is not an aristocratic bordelou, it is made of tin. Let's go on to the next. Now, in the mid 1800s, English blue and white transfer porcelain was made in Staffordshire. And I'm sure many people have Staffordshire uh, print, transfer print uh, in their family collection of dishes. Uh, their illustrations from a lot of the uh, books of that period, but I have a number of these. They come in various shapes. Some of them have the same uh, illustrations, but by different, com different companies and different uh, uh, shapes. So that uh, these were commonly used. Uh, there is one that has a picture of the Boston State House. Uh, it's the only one I've ever seen. I've searched, but I can't find any Bordelous that were used here in the United States. Let's go on to the next slide. Now, in addition to metal and porcelain, uh, there is glass. The one on top is called cranberry glass, which is used, where, which is made by a combination of liquid gold and glass. The one on the bottom is a large cut glass, early Georgian, George IV uh, a Bordelou with sterling silver mounts on the handle. Quite heavy, quite large but again, very uh, interesting for the period of time it was used. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, this is the final one of uh, 
this small selection that I'm going to show you. This is 19th century. It is KPM, which is the Kaiser Porcelain Manufaktur in Berlin. And obviously, as you can see, it is in the shape of a swan. Very pretty. And uh, I certainly don't think anybody would have any qualms about using it. So uh, that is a small selection of the uh, Bordelous I have. Another One other quick story. Years ago, Georgette Koopman, who was uh, a wonderful woman here in, in Hartford, visited the house and had dinner. And I had the uh, Bordelous on the, uh, uh, in the dining room. And she approached my wife and she said, Gail, are those what I think they are? So they got moved upstairs. Um, it, it does seem interesting, one person commented, that porcelain and its potential to break does seem to be impractical. Uh, metal seems to make more sense. Why do you think there's still more porcelain ones around? Well, the porcelain can be decorated and uh, in different shapes. Uh, so I think uh, people use them because they were, you know, lovely objects. I also have a question. What is the most interesting place uh, or source you have discovered a Bordelou? Uh, well, it turned out that when my youngest son got married in uh, Rhode Island and we had some time, I went to an antique store and lo and behold, there was a Chinese male urinal, but it was made out of wood. And uh, that was, I think, the, the most interesting find. That's really nice. And I think, is there anyone else with questions we can entertain? Oh, oh I'm scrolling down. <laughs> Actually, the person who asked that question is your younger son. Oh, what are Hello, you? Seth. <laughs> is there a concern with wooden urinals or for splinters? <laughs> uh, I hadn't. That had question hasn't been raised before. The only other interesting one I saw once at the. Uh, uh, at the museum in, in the Victoria and Albert in London was made out of leather. So I think that leather and wood are not the typical uh, materials that one would make Bordelous out of. I, I would probably agree, not only learning about Bordelous from you. Okay. Do we have any more questions? I think that might wrap things up. So I thank I everybody for uh, humoring me. And uh, I hope uh, somebody has uh, learned a few things. And uh, I think uh, I would call your attention to uh, the slide that uh, talks about a couple of uh, new things that will be presented by the Hartford Medical Society. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Costo for sharing his wonderful collection. And we would welcome other Hartford Medical Society members to share their collection. We would be glad to host a lunchtime learning of your medical curiosities or any curiosities you might be collecting. I think it's a fascinating option, uh, opportunity to be able to share your interests with the members and have it live in perpetuity uh, with our online video library. I would like to point out that we are very excited to welcome Dr. Uh, Raza to our Zoom stage on April 1st. This is no April Fool's joke. It is uh, a, a very important discussion, free for HMS members, about cancer and its uh, effects on us and how maybe we could start using our resources to try to stop cancer at the first cell which is also the title of her book. We also are doing a program in conjunction with the Cedar Hill Cemetery on Lest We Forget Infectious Diseases from 1850 to 1918. Uh, infectious diseases is always a fun topic. And this one is based on, on Hartford's history. 
So I would urge you all to sign up for these events. And if you have any program ideas, please share it on the survey that will pop up on your screen. I'm Tessa O'Sullivan. I'm your executive director of the Hartford Medical Society. And thank you for joining us this afternoon.